The long-awaited launch of the James Webb Space Telescope has finally happened. We have followed the construction of this engineering marvel since the very beginning of SciShow, but Webb's creation began way before that with a planned launch in 2007. So come with us on a trip down memory lane to reminisce on the Webb's long road to launch. The first time we mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope on SciShow was in 2012, SciShow's first year. And by that point, its launch had already been delayed, so here is that introduction to the James James Webb Space Telescope. Last week, NASA announced that the first of Webb's four observing instruments, the Mid-Infrared Instrument, or MIRI, has been finished and sent to Maryland's Goddard Space Flight Center. MIRI was assembled by the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK, and it'll observe light in the mid-infrared wavelength. This will allow the telescope to detect distant old galaxies, find dust-shrouded newly forming stars that can't be seen with visible light, and possibly even pick up on traces of the so-called first light from the earliest forming stars in the universe. And let me tell you, the JWST is a frickin' marvel of engineering. MIRI will observe light by way of Webb's primary segmented mirror, whose collecting area is about 25 square meters and is coated with a microscopically thin layer of gold, because gold best reflects infrared light. Astronomers say that MIRI will have 50 times the sensitivity and 7 times the resolution of NASA's only other infrared space telescope, the Spitzer. Webb's three other instruments, a camera and two kinds of spectrographs, will make observations at even shorter wavelengths of infrared light. Those instruments are still in development, and we'll keep you posted on that. Back in 2012, when that video came out, Spitzer was the only other active infrared space telescope. And because of Webb's delays, scientists actually squeezed two extra years' worth of data out of Spitzer before its retirement in January of 2020. But now Webb will take Spitzer's place as the only active infrared space telescope, at least until another one gets up. In contrast to Spitzer, scientists are sending Webb way farther into space than they ever dared to send other telescopes. And here is why. We all know what a telescope is. But if you tried to describe one, you might say something like, it's a tube with lenses in it, which would be quite wrong. A telescope is just a device that lets you see far away things close up. And you may be surprised to discover that neither a tube nor lenses are required. The first telescope was created in Holland, probably by Hans Lippershey in 1608. And yes, it was a tube with lenses in it. But lenses are heavy and expensive and tend to bend different wavelengths of light differently, making distant images blurry. Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and Christian Huygens all used this sort of telescope, though, and to great effect. It was so revolutionary that Galileo was imprisoned for the knowledge he obtained from it. Before his persecution, Galileo was working on a new design for a new telescope, one that used mirrors instead of lenses. But the world would have to wait for Isaac Newton, fresh from getting hit in the head by apples and inventing calculus to come along and actually build the thing. Newton's reflecting rather than refracting telescope was the first of its kind. But it wasn't long before a more advanced model, the Cassegrain telescope, with one parabolic primary mirror reflecting onto a hyperbolic secondary mirror, kicked it to the curb. Laurent Cassegrain published the design of his telescope in 1668, and it remains, to this day, pretty much the standard, from the telescope in your geeky neighbor's backyard to the Hubble. Once we had the Cassegrain system, the design was no longer the limitation. The atmosphere was. The air around our planet, even on the clearest days, scatters light and makes extremely distant observation impossible. While a lot was done to improve on the Cassegrain design with bigger, better mirrors, the only way to leap forward was to put one in orbit. Which is exactly what we did in 1990 with the Hubble. And the Hubble? is magnificent. I believe it to be one of the primary legacies of our time, providing some of the most inspiring pictures and detailed data about our universe, stuff that we could never have acquired without it. But what comes next? Well, I got to learn all about that when I visited the team responsible for building the next big thing in telescopes at Northrop Grumman in Southern California, the James Webb Space Telescope. Astrophysics every 10 years, you know, 2000, 2010, does a survey and says, what do we want? And they said, we want an infrared telescope. The spectrum of light is massive. We see only a very tiny percentage of that. And there are telescopes that can see at pretty much every wavelength. But perhaps the hardest part of the spectrum for astronomers to see is the infrared. IR radiation is everywhere. We're bathed in it all the time. So any detector designed to see faint infrared light has to contend with all that background radiation. It would pick up heat from the Earth, from the sun, from nearby machinery. There's just no way to block it all out. Well, actually, there is one way put the telescope a million miles from Earth with five sheets of insulating plastic between it and the primary IR source in our solar system, the Sun. Everything about the Webb telescope is there to help it see into that one blind spot that we still have. Things, for example, like the size of its mirrors. So you will see 
picture's just about as good and as finely and in much detail as airs you see from Hubble, it's just in the infrared. And you can do this because the mirror is so much larger. The heat shields. Almost 600 degrees, right, from, from one side from to the other. Front. 600 degrees Fahrenheit. 1.2 million right. SPF, I think. The location of the telescope. Infrared lights, a lot like heat radiation, so the whole thing has to be very, very cold. And that's why we're putting it out in deep space. And the mirror's gold coating. And the wavelengths of interest. Okay. Gold is better at reflecting infrared wavelengths. So the question remains, what will the web be able to show us? You can tell things like um, what kind of chemicals are, are in atmospheres of, of exoplanets, for example, or you can tell what uh, molecules are in a certain galaxy, or, or all these different things. You can tell how stars are forming, how many stars are forming. All of that and the very beginning of the universe, too. In 2018, when the web deploys, all will be revealed, and the next chapter will begin. That clip was also from a video posted in 2012, but even at that point, scientists knew Webb wasn't going to launch for at least six years. Still, 2018 might have been optimistic, given how truly revolutionary Webb's design is. No one had ever made anything like it. So here is why this telescope had to have a completely new design. You'll get no arguments from me. The Hubble Space Telescope is fantastic, but it's not fantastic at everything. In fact, it and nearly every other telescope is crap at detecting most of the infrared wavelengths of light. The Hubble can detect the near-infrared, the shortest wavelengths of IR that are closest to visible light, but the real juicy goodness is in the mid-infrared wavelengths that are impossible to capture from most places on Earth, and still hard as heck to detect in space. Now, if you tried to scale up the Hubble's mirror to work in that range, it would be one larger in diameter than the biggest rockets that currently exist in order to collect enough light, two maddeningly difficult, if not impossible, to accurately polish, three deformed beyond usability at the extremely low temperatures necessary to see IR light, four too heavy to launch, and five, worst of all, still unable to reflect light at the infrared range. So yeah, there's a reason people said that building a high-resolution IR telescope was impossible. Actually, five reasons that we just discussed. But it is possible, because we've built this mirror. We've taken each of those challenges on, and remarkably, we're finished. Now it's just a matter of waiting for the rest of the James Webb Space Telescope to be completed and sent into deep space to start taking pretty pictures. Well, let's take a look at those five big problems and with the help of Northrop Grumman's Scott Willoughby, determine how we overcame each of them. First, the vehicle used to launch the Webb into space, the Ariane 5 rocket, has a diameter of five and a half meters. And the Webb's telescope meter has a diameter of about six and a half meters. And that's not even mentioning that it would be impossible to polish a mirror that big, so yeah, problematic. Solution, build your mirror in 18 foldable pieces. The reason we built those in 18 segments instead of one, I was mentioned there was two reasons. One is we basically couldn't polish a mirror that big. And then the other thing is we had to segment it so we could put three and three on a hinge line. As the telescope travels to its destination, these mirrors will fold out. In fact, the whole thing will transform out of its little cocoon into the beautiful butterfly that it was meant to be. Hot stuff, problem number one and number two solved. Now, number three. How do you make a mirror on Earth that will work in deep space? First, you use beryllium. Beryllium was chosen because at these cold temperatures, it's it holds its its shape, you know, basically mm -hmm. precisely. You can't right. afford to have this be moving can't around. But it's more than that. They have to anticipate how the mirrors will deform at 40 degrees above absolute zero. They actually only finish the prescription of the mirror, just like the prescription in my glasses, after bringing the mirror down to negative 387 degrees Fahrenheit to see what its shape will be. It would be blurry at room temperature, yeah. so when it goes down to 40 degrees above absolute zero, it crisps up. Still, beryllium, though fantastic in cold temperatures, is way too heavy to launch. So now we must solve problem number four, how to be lighter per square meter than Hubble's mirror. Well, hollow the sucker out. I think the block is about 400 pounds and it ends up being about 40 pounds. It's a very thin face sheet and if you looked at the back of it, it's basically a grid of ribs. One piece of metal uh, that gets basically hogged out by a machine. And finally, how do you get it to reflect infrared when beryllium is crap at even being a regular mirror? Well, you find the one metal that reflects infrared so well that it's the only metal that actually appears reddish to the human eye. Gold. Okay. Gold is better at reflecting infrared wavelengths. It goes on in angstroms. It's done in New Jersey, which is really important. That's the most important <laughs> contribution to this telescope is the, uh, the bedazzling, which you would think would come from New Jersey. All 
that gold spread out across 25 square meters. You'd think it would be a ton of gold, but it literally goes on atoms at a time. The amount of gold in these mirrors is roughly equivalent to the amount of gold in 10 wedding rings, no more than 50 grams. Dang. And now we have done it. We have a lightweight mirror that reflects infrared light very well, is perfectly polished to operate at very low temperatures, and can fold up into the payload of an Ariane 5 rocket. If you got a problem, these are the folks to fix it for you, as long as you got a couple billion dollars lying around. And the way scientists described the 18 foldable sections of Webb's mirror stayed true to the final product. The first mirror was installed in November of 2015, and the final mirror was put in place in February of 2016. But finishing the mirror, while an incredible feat, is still far from finishing the telescope. So here's the update from 2016, when they had completed yet another piece of the telescope jigsaw. Webb has been in development for 20 years now, and it's finally in the home stretch. Last week, the telescope part of Webb was finished, which includes the mirrors and all the scientific instruments. So basically, all that's left to do before launch is some rigorous flight testing. Once it's launched, the telescope will mainly view the universe in infrared, the wavelength associated with heat. That will give us a whole new perspective, since the Hubble Space Telescope's range doesn't include several kinds of infrared light. Webb is also more sensitive than the Hubble, so it'll be able to give us lots of extra detail. But even though construction on the telescope is over, it has to pass a whole bunch of tests before it can start its mission in space. Engineers have already completed a pre-test to confirm that the telescope's optics are working, which they are. And because rocket launches are loud and pretty violent, they'll now put the telescope through sound and vibration tests to make sure it won't be damaged on the way into orbit. And if it survives these tests without damage, next up are cryogenic tests to make sure it can handle the super cold temperatures of space. Finally, the telescope will be shipped to California, where it'll be attached to the rest of the spacecraft, the sun shield to protect it from the heat of the sun, and the propulsion and communication systems. After the last few tests wrap up, the completed spacecraft will be shipped to French Guiana to launch aboard the European Ariane 5 rocket. If everything goes as planned, the James Webb Space Telescope will launch in October 2018. With Webb, we're hoping to learn about a lot of different things, like the oldest galaxies in the universe, other star systems, and even worlds closer to home, like Jupiter's moon Europa. So whether you're watching for the greatest supermoon in almost 70 years or waiting for the world's best space telescope, you can expect a beautiful view of space coming your way soon. Now you might have thought that building a giant mirror and a telescope would be the extent of building a telescope with a giant mirror. But there were still more tests researchers needed to run to make sure everything was doing good. Well, the tests didn't go well. If you'll notice, in 2016, we still thought Webb's launch was only a few years away. Now that it has launched, we can finally breathe, but for those of us who have been following the Webb's progress over the years, this has been an emotionally taxing saga. So here are some more details from the highs and lows of those various tests. For years, NASA has been working on an amazing telescope. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. And at one point, it was intended to launch in 2007. We've been talking about this project since SciShow started, because James Webb could transform our understanding of the universe. But honestly, being a fan of this telescope is sometimes hard work. After years of seeing it fail tests and get postponed, things can feel discouraging. Today, though, I have some good news. Last week, after more than a decade of delays, the two halves of the telescope have finally been joined together. Although it won't do identical work, James Webb is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, which will likely stop working in the mid-2020s. And once Webb launches, it'll be charged with a full complement of missions. Using infrared light, it'll study the composition of exoplanets, probe the oldest galaxies we can see, and maybe even answer our questions about what the universe is made of. But before it can do any of that, it needs to launch. And before it can launch, it needs to be fully tested. Until recently, Webb's two main halves were tested separately, but now we can test them together. One half consists of the telescope itself. That's the part with gold-coated mirrors and a suite of instruments. The other half has the spacecraft, which will steer the telescope, along with the giant five-layer sun shield that will block light from the sun, earth, and moon. Blocking this light will help keep the telescope cold, which is a must since heat is a major source of infrared radiation. So if it's not cold enough, an infrared telescope's own heat can overwhelm its instruments while it's trying to monitor distant dim objects. The sun shield will solve a lot of that problem, but the telescope will also have a bit of cold helium to keep some of its instruments extra chilly. Of course, just because the telescope is mostly assembled doesn't mean it's ready for launch. Engineers still have to connect the electronics between the two halves, and after that, they have to test them all together. They'll have to make sure they wired everything correctly and that the equipment will survive deployment and the vacuum of space. That means there's still room for error, but hopefully things will go well and the telescope will finally launch in March of 2021. So our 
2019 update finally accepted that Webb would launch in 2021. At least we got the year right, because as Marilyn Monroe knew, accessories are everything. And Webb didn't quite have all of the protective accessories nailed down yet. Here is the unforeseen accessory delay. The James Webb Space Telescope is a spectacular piece of engineering more complex than any telescope we've ever sent into space. But Webb is not, in fact, in space. Yet. Astronomers and the interested public alike are getting pretty impatient to see this telescope in space and doing science. But some of the reasons it's not there yet are actually good. It's just part of building something that no one's ever built before. Webb was originally conceived as the successor to both Hubble and the Infrared Spitzer Space Telescope. Once fully deployed, it'll be a multi-purpose observatory, capable of examining the planets in our own solar system, as well as exoplanets in orbit around other stars. But its primary mission is to delve deep into the origins of the universe itself to as little as 200 million years after the Big Bang, when some of the earliest stars and galaxies were forming. By studying the light from these ancient and incredibly distant galaxies, scientists hope to uncover some of the secrets of the universe as a whole, how it came to be, and what its fate will be. But capturing the light from distant stars is no easy task. The universe is expanding, and as the earliest light travels toward us, its wavelengths get stretched out in a phenomenon known as redshift. As the wavelengths stretch, they become redder. The earliest stars are so far away, and their light is so stretched that it's no longer red, but infrared. That's why we build telescopes like Spitzer and now Webb, to see into that infrared. Its mirror is six and a half meters across, to make it as sensitive as possible. And since nearby sources of infrared light, like the Earth and the Sun, could drown out those dim old galaxies, engineers have gotten really creative in their attempt to protect it. Among these creative ideas is an immense sun shield the size of a tennis court. Not only would this help block the sun's glare, it would also keep Webb's delicate instruments cool. And nobody's ever built a sun shield like this before. Other infrared telescopes have used either smaller shields or liquid coolants. And it's ambitious ideas like this that have delayed the telescope again and again. It was proposed in 1996 for a 2007 launch. In 2019, as we're making this video, all of the parts of the telescope have been manufactured. But the launch has been pushed back once again, this time to 2021. Here's the thing, the technical challenges in building something like this are massive. There are nearly 350 single point failures on the telescope, which means that if just one of them breaks down, the entire observatory is rendered useless. And its planned orbit around the sun will take it 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth, so there's no way of fixing something that goes wrong once it's up there, like we've done with Hubble in the past. Everything has to be just right the first time. And obviously, that's even harder when engineers are inventing new technologies from scratch, like micro shutters on the telescope's sensor, tiny doors that help block out unwanted light. And then there's that sun shield. Not only is it the size of a tennis court, but it has five separate kite-shaped layers, and they're each made from a special material coated in aluminum and silicon to help it reflect the sun's radiation and survive in the harsh environment of space. Oh, and then it has to fit onto a rocket. The whole thing must be folded up tightly during launch, then deployed once Webb reaches orbit. And that's hard. The tech behind the telescope's mirror is new, too. With a total diameter of 6.5 meters, it's made up of 18 individually adjustable hexagonal mirrors, made from beryllium and coated with gold. Each mirror needs to be flawless and perfectly adjustable so the telescope can focus. Even the launch and deployment are new territory for NASA. The telescope will be transported by sea to French Guiana and launched on the French-made Ariane 5 rocket. NASA hasn't done any of these things before. Because every element of the design, construction, and launch is so complex and so new, it's been really difficult to estimate how long the project as a whole will take. And as each part of the process has progressed, it's become clear that these brand new technologies are taking longer than expected to get just right. And there's the usual dose of human error, too, as you should expect with any huge undertaking. Perhaps the most infamous example is the bolt incident. During a vibration test, the fastening bolts that secured the sunshield cover weren't fully tightened because they were afraid they'd snag and tear the sunshield itself. Seems fair. But a bunch of bolts and fasteners came loose, dropping into the body of the spacecraft, and finding and retrieving them caused more delays. Because of all these delays, NASA appointed an independent review board in early 2019 to figure out why things were going so slowly and whether the project was even worth continuing. And the board concluded that what they called the awesome scientific potential that the telescope offers 
will be worth the effort and the wait. So the project is still on. And in fact, in August 2019, NASA announced that the telescope had at long last been assembled and was ready to move forward. With a long list of recommendations from the board and a lot of enthusiasm from all of us who have been waiting for this to happen for a long time, the launch is now set for March 2021. Let's hope no more bolts come loose before then. And if the idea of launching the largest and most expensive space probe into orbit isn't enough pressure on its own, think about never being able to fix something that cost you $10 billion, because it's just so far away. Not gonna lie, that's a little terrifying. But that might not necessarily be true, because NASA has been able to fix some problems on other telescopes that we didn't think we would be able to solve at their time of launch. For example, the Kepler Space Telescope was farther away than the serviceable Hubble, but the NASA team still realigned the telescope every 80 days. So while it seems like we had to run millions of tests to get everything perfect before Webb's launch, time will tell if researchers can come up with new inventive ideas for how to fix problems that might arise in Webb's future. Future, because we have high hopes for Webb's discoveries. Here is one example. Last week, a team of Harvard astronomers proposed a new method for detecting intelligent alien life using the James Webb Space Telescope. When measuring chemical spectra on faraway planets, we already look for certain chemical signals, like specific combinations of oxygen and methane, or an abundance of CO2, as indicators of respiration and therefore life. But the Harvard team suggests looking further for chemical signals that could be associated with intelligent or not so intelligent life, depending on how you look at it pollution. We could look for concentrations of molecules with high global warming potential, like methane and ammonia, but these can also be naturally emitted. The trick, the astronomers argue, is to look for a chemical that's clearly synthesized. So they propose that we start looking for things like chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, human-made molecules containing carbon, chlorine, and fluorine whose properties make them good refrigerants, propellants, and solvents. The synthesis of these compounds is closely regulated today, because after we release loads and loads of them into our atmosphere during the 20th century, we realize that they break apart and release chlorine atoms, which steal oxygen atoms from ozone molecules. In other words, CFCs trap heat and contribute to the greenhouse gas effect, while also destroying our atmosphere's protective layer of ozone, which shields us from the sun's UV radiation. The team theorizes that alien civilizations like ours might release similar chemicals as a result of industrial development. They went so far as to focus on two common CFC molecules that we should target, carbon tetrafluoride and tri chlorofluoromethane, and worked out which patterns the spectrographs on the James Webb Telescope would need to look for to detect these molecules. Problem is, the James Webb Telescope probably isn't powerful enough to find dirty alien worlds this way. As it stands now, it would only be able to spot the chemicals if they were 10 times as abundant as they are on Earth which is saying something. So hey, at least we have another option. Since it sounds like we might have to go back to the drawing board to figure out how to find water on other worlds, at least we can also start looking for signs of aliens poisoning their planets. And hopefully, Webb finds all of that and more. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow Space, and thank you to our Patreon patrons who have helped us keep you updated across more than a decade of delays. This has been quite a journey. Congratulations to everyone who worked on this telescope, and also congratulations to all of Earth who is going to get to benefit from its work. 